I was invited here today to talk about a very short book that I'm going to uh, publish very soon on this a series called Palgrave Pivot, which has only 50,000 word long books. And um, the book, you already know the title, is called Media Resistance, uh, Protest, Dislike, Abstention. And it is going to be open access. Uh, fortunately, so everybody can read it. <laughs> and my background is in television studies and media history. And of course we can start from the um, sort of situation today with a lot of uh, talk and discussion about digital detox, digital disconnection, digital fasting, making having a balanced digital diet, which is a huge phenomenon at the moment, as you will know. You will find a lot of help sites for example, how to disconnect or how to quit Facebook has more than 2 million hits. It's translated, I think, into 20 languages, Chinese, Indonesian languages, everything, and they all have several sort of million hits. So if it's a big phenomenon trying to get away from digital media or trying to control it. And um, one perspective is that the, you can get identity from disliking things just as much as getting identity from liking things. So, for example, not having a car, or not eating carbs, or not being on Facebook, or not watching television, can provide you with an identity just as much as being on Facebook, or being a television fan. You know, so, sort of a negative identity making. And it's interesting that the media have always been objects of of course, ambivalence. Those of us who have studied media and communication technology throughout their history know they've always been, people have always been ambivalent to them, okay? So uh, disliking them and abstaining from television, for example, has always been a possible identity maker. You know, it's the same way as actually watching television. Uh, if you go to media studies, um, the, the way resistors, if you now look at the perspective of media resistance, you know, which is the context that I am using, then I'm talking about uh, media resistance as a sort of generalized resistance, okay? It's not a protest against necessarily a single service or a single film or something, but people who dislike media more generally, a whole medium, a whole genre, a whole function. And uh, historically, of course, uh, there there is a lot of documented media skepticism, skepticism, of course, back to print and uh, writing the alphabet. I mean, there has been sort of, whether it's the same historical phenomenon can be discussed, but uh, ever since sort of, uh, ever since printing or even before with the ancients, you can, you know, there's resistance to like the alphabet. Uh, there has been skepticism about new modes of communication. People have been skeptical and people have the argument against the alphabet for, was, for example, that it would make people forgetful. Mm -hmm. uh, because people before that, people would have to memorize. And with the alphabet, of course, you can just forget. The interesting thing is when you start th seeing things from the resistors' perspective, you realize they have a really good cause. <laughs> so, in media studies, the perspective on people who resist the media is uh, usually quite negative, okay? People who um, do not use media or dislike the media are often labeled, of course, as Luddites, you know. It's very often used to describe people who are skeptical to media, skeptical to technology. Another word that's very often used in media studies is uh, a moral panic or a media panic. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, this, this word panic, even though this is is a term to describe a social phenomenon. It rubs off on the resistors. So they are often called panicky or moralists, irrational. Of course, also the concept of technophobia uh, alludes to the same thing. So the, the perception of resistors in media studies is very often that they are irrational, uh, they have, are panicky. Uh, uh, whereas we are rational, they are irrational, and they um, they are moralists or pessimists and against technology. And I have to say, in many cases, this is actually true. Uh, but it's interesting also to look, if you look at it, at media resistance or being against media communication technology, if you look at it from the resistors' point of view, 
they their argument would be that they um, the media people are panicky, irrational, isolated, marginalized because they do not the people who like media or use social media or watch television. They live in an artificial world and they haven't really understood what is real world. Okay, so if you turn the argument, you get exactly the sort of the same argument back. Uh, and very often, uh, and that's quite interesting to turn the tables. And the people, for example, who um, were against television, there was a big, broad social movement against television. They would, of course, argue that real life is non television life. You know, television is artificial, bad, trashy, commercial, bad life. Not having television is good life, real life. In the book, I write about three phases of media resistance. I write about media resistance at the breakthrough for the early mass media, which is like cinema, comics, radio, uh, print media, popular literature, okay? So breakthrough for mass communications. Then I write about television resistance, which is, of course, in the 1900s, mid-1900s to about 2000. And then I write about digital media resistance, online media resistance, and social media resistance. So these are nicely three phases. What you can say about this, the transition from television to digital media resistance is at the television phase, um, or the digital media. For many people, uh, digital media was a savior from television, okay? Digital media should do good again what television had done bad, because television was seen as bad. So there's great optimism connected with digital media. But then with Web 2.0, uh, yeah, uh, uh, there's also an increasing disappointment with digital media, as you know. And this is one of the, uh, this is one of the expressions that sort of comes out in the digital detox. So from this very optimism, it has turned to pessimism and much more skepticism. And actually, if you go back historically, you can see the same thing in radio, for example. Radio had great hopes, but then it turned to disappointment. Uh, so there's, there's always a sort of historical parallel, whereas television was disliked from the beginning, and now it's actually beginning to be more liked again. So if you compare these different media, for example, with television, one of the great arguments, as you will know, against television was that it made people passive. Uh, however, now, since the great argument is that, uh, or the great argument of resistors, is that digital media make people hyperactive. Uh, television is now seen by many people to make them calm and focused and, co and concentrated. <laughs> no. So, some of these shifts actually helps to rehabilitate a previous medium. So when people start to get dissolution with a new medium, at the same time you rehabilitate an older medium. So now television looks much better. And television is now sort of making people calm, focused, collected. It connects the family instead of sort of everybody sitting with their own screen. <laughs> the research questions, three research questions. The first is what is at stake, okay? According to resistors, what do they feel is at stake with media? The interesting thing when you ask the what is at stake questions, is you find out that the, the people who are, hate media use just the same type of argument as the people who like media. For example, people say that they are against social media for reasons of community, because they think that social media are isolating people instead of bringing them together. Whereas the people who like social media say they are in favor of social media because it brings people together. For example, the argument of education and enlightenment, people will say, Social media, television, radio destroys enlightenment or promotes enlightenment. So we can really argue that in the what is at stake question, that resistors are just as grounded in values as the people who are not resistors. So that's one question, what is at stake? The other question is what to do? And I look at what have people who dislike media and communication technology actually done or wanted to do about it. And it's very nice to read the, for example, if you read books that are very critical to media, like Nicholas Carr, The Shallows, I'm sure you've seen some of this book, uh, Andrew Keane, um, Sherry Turkle for that matter. It's really interesting to read the what to do section at the end, 
you know, what do they actually argue should be done? And there is a great change from previous earlier media to television to social media. Because uh, with the early media, cinema and everything, <coughs> people would always argue for legislation, legal, political, institutional control. With television, there was a big anti-television movement, particularly strong in the States. For example, TV Free America. They wanted to use a TV turn off weeks. You know, you probably heard about TV turn off week. And they saw that as a goal to get rid of television for good. They say that 50,000 schools every year had t TV turn off week, etc. With digital media, it's much more complicated to have a turn off. I'll return to that in a second. I'll just say first that the third source that I use in addition to testimonials from people, you know, that I always said, testimonials, self-help things, and non-fiction literature arguments, the third source that I use are films and fiction. A lot of the source and inspiration for resistance comes from utopian, dystopian fiction and film. Okay, so if you read, for example, three classics, Books, 1984, um, Fahrenheit 451, and Brave New World, they tell you how terrible media are, okay? There's a lot of really, really terrible media stuff in those books, and they are, in a sense, very similar. So it's about sort of how people are really invaded by this utopian media. And these three books are sources of inspiration for a lot of literature, and very often people who are against media are much more inspired by dystopian fiction than they are by research, for example, or media research. They hate media research, uh, but they really like dystopian fiction. And then I've also used films. Uh, the, yeah, I've used films like, I don't know, there's a couple of films about social media that are among my sources. One is called Disconnect. I don't know if you've seen it. It's about people, how society really is disconnected because everybody's chatting away. And another is called Her, which is about virtual reality. Yeah. What these films do, they help to circulate, they are sort of cultural resources, okay? They help to circulate these ideas that media are bad. And they make it into sort of, a lot of them are global be bestsellers, so they're really <coughs> known works. For television films, I have, for example, a film called The Truman Show. Really, really great films which show how society is destroyed by television, okay? Or by social media. There's lots of films literature, everything that tells this story about how terrible media are, how it de destroys us. It's satirical, but still, you know. And sometimes when you look at studies of, um, and that's inter of people who disconnect, for example, like uh, of, of uh, interview study with people who disconnect, they see, it seems like a quite small marginalized phenomenon. They seem like they're very special and very different and they're strange and alone. But what I have wanted to do with this short book is to try to place it in a much bigger social, historical and cultural context and show that there are great sort of strands in our culture that, that, that sort of sustain this kind of understanding of media, you know, and it's also sustained by cultural products. So finally, to resisting digital media is very difficult. Uh, when you compare with resisting television, you could just turn it off. It's really interesting to read about all the struggles people have who want to do, for example, one week screen-free week. It's really hard. And often, if you want to do some screen-free, uh, you it's it's described in detail how you have to first email, no, tell all your friends on Facebook, you know, to call you instead. There's a lot of online work to do. Uh, and you have to make sure you write down all the people, all the phone numbers. So the whole ubiquity of the media makes it really difficult to disentangle. And it's interesting to, to read about people who try to do it. And at the same time, the people who advocate digital detox are very keen to spread the word, okay? So they give you, recommend you all sorts of tweets and Facebook posts you can make to get off Facebook <laughs> compared to television. Uh, it's become really difficult, hard to become a resistor. You have to really struggle. It's a lot, a lot of work to do it. And a lot of that work is actually online. Now, uh, everybody needs a measure of resistance to be able to survive. Uh, and now it's interesting to see, okay, what, uh, because you cannot 
you just cannot. And, and also because uh, media industries are so well equipped, the gamification of life, I mean, it's are so well equipped to get you, to interrupt you from what you are doing. You know, there, there's so much intellectual effort going into interrupting you. And of course, this is for us who are teachers in academia. We know we are fighting for students' attention with an industry that's much better at interrupting than we are. And that's much better at keeping their sustained attention than we are. And who have sort of the brightest brains to interrupt you from doing your studies and being on Facebook or, or you know, catching Pokemon or, or doing something else. <laughs> That's sort of the, the lesson that we all need to be sometimes or partly resistors. Or you can't sleep, can't work, can't study, can't have a family. You know, so all these discussions now that are, are about meals, for example. Every, every, every meal, every, every meeting have to have this discussion, okay, what, how should we regulate it, sort of, or how should we practice it? We all need a measure of sort of, uh, what's it called, reverse domestication. We sort of need to de-domesticate ourselves from, from it to be able to do the basic things in life.